All right, let's finish up chapter 10. Let's look at key issue four, where we're uh, taking a look at why do farmers face economic difficulties, challenges in the developing countries, subsistence farming, and population growth. The challenge is to grow enough food for this rapidly growing population. Plus now, the people in cities can't grow food. Think about it. Lots of people living in buildings can't grow food, so you have to grow food for all of them too. These new farming methods, plows replacing hand tools, using more manure, terracing and irrigation, these are ways to combat that. They allow their land to fallow for shorter periods of time, which isn't necessarily good, but areas they might have are forest fallow, where they let it sit for 20 years, bush fallow, where they let it grow back up to like bush size and they let it fallow for 10 years, short fallow, only two years. These are all techniques that they're using to help feed more people. And then annual cropping, where they fields are used every year, but they rotate between legumes and roots. So these are different nutrients pulled and put back into the ground. Or they might use multi-cropping, where fields are used several times per year, and they're not allowed to fallow at all. So they're really running the ground out of its nutrients. Subsistence farming and international trade. Here's the deal. Subsistence farmers have to grow food for their own families in the community, but now to compete, they also have to grow and sell internationally, which is a real big challenge because farmers can't afford new tools and they certainly can't afford fertilizers. So the land is split between food for families and crops for export. More challenges in the developing countries. Drug crops. Let's face it. If you can make a lot more money by growing uh, drugs and you're trying to take care of your family, it's only natural that people are going to do whatever they can to support themselves. So a lot of crops are uh, being grown as converted to drugs. So for example, cocaine is derived from the coca leaf and you find these mostly in Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. Now the interesting thing is, I've been to all three of these countries, in Colombia, growing coca leaf is illegal. They even spray to kill the crops, even when they find like the hidden, the hidden farms that are growing the coca leaf because a lot of it's you know, processed and sent to the United States as cocaine. But in Peru, growing of the coca leaf is completely legal. As a matter of fact, they drink coca tea over there. Um, a lot of times when we were hiking over the Andes Mountains, we drank coca tea. Not illegal there. Colombia, totally illegal. Interesting. Heroin, heroin, which is derived from the raw opium gum, it's produced by the poppy plant. You find this mostly in Afghanistan, like 90%. Most of it's in Afghanistan, but also in Myanmar and Laos. And then marijuana is produced pretty much everywhere from the cannabis sativa plant. And uh, a lot of it's found in Mexico and sold to the richer developed country of the United States just north. Food prices. Price has been the biggest issue in the 21st century rather than supply. Think about that. We've got enough. It just costs too much. The price has doubled from 2062. I cannot talk at all. I'm trying to get this done for people. And I'm just, I'm sorry. I'll dig back in. I'm insane. What can I say? Food prices, well, they doubled from 2006 to 2008 because we had poor weather in the South Pacific and North America. There was a higher demand, especially in China and India, because of increasing population. And there were smaller breakthroughs, meaning we didn't come up with more and more efficient ways to grow the food, so it slowly began to get more expensive. And we began to use crops for biofuels instead of food, meaning if we grew corn, we weren't necessarily growing it to feed people or cows. We were growing it as uh, to be used in cars which isn't necessarily true, but that's what Rubenstein put, so there. So we look at where heroin comes from, and, you know, cocaine, all, all drugs. Here's our coca plant, of course, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, most of it going to the United States, some of it going to Europe. We look at opium from Afghanistan region, a lot of it going to Europe. You know, you don't think about too many people uh, having heroin, and well, that's not true, but there's obviously a heroin problem in the United States as well, but so much of it goes directly to Europe. Africa's food supply shortage. So sub-Saharan Africa, meaning below the Saharan desert, 
it struggles to keep food production ahead of population growth. Here's why. Famine wipes out a lot of the, a lot of the crops, so they're not able to grow enough crops. Animals have overgrazed areas. Like, there's so much land that's being overused or misused that even when you have animals, they're like eating all the grass. So guess what? They can't grow crops there either because the nutrients in the grass are gone. It's hard to find water in Africa because it's not irrigated very well. And if you got a famine as well, you got problems finding water. And the government, they attempt to keep food costs low for urban residents. So they force down the price, but then farmers who are growing it and sweating, trying to get every ounce of crop out, they can't sell it to make a profit because the government keeps the prices low. So if you can't make a profit, why would you grow more than you need for your own family? And we look at this graph here, we see that food production and population have both kind of gone up at the same pace. Um, food per capita, meaning food per person, has kind of remained even though. Challenges for farmers in developed countries. We looked at developing, now let's look at developed countries. What's their problems? Well, there's a lot of overproduction in commercial farming. Farmers suffer because they can make too much food. Um, and they make so much that they have an oversupply and people don't need that much. This occurs because commercial farming is extremely efficient with new technologies, fertilizers, pesticides, and management practices. The demand is stagnant. It's stagnant because in most developed countries, there's a low population growth and markets are already saturated. Meaning, uh, people have already got tons of corn in the United States. So there's not going to be like a huge demand because our population isn't really growing, except from immigration. So that's why the United States continues to sustain itself, really. Lots of European countries, population isn't growing, there's not tons of immigration, so farmers have a hard time making a profit each year. To address this in the United States, um, they, encourage, they encourage farmers not to grow crops in excess. Meaning, if you think you can make a whole bunch of money by growing tons of corn, don't. Because everybody's going to be growing corn, so just grow enough. The U.S. government also pays farmers when prices are low. Because we got to still have farmers, so when prices are low, the United States government will give money back to the farmers. The U.S. government also buys surplus production and sells or donates it to foreign governments. So if you're growing soybeans and there's too many soybeans to sell, like maybe everybody had a bunch of soybeans this year, as my voice cracks. If everybody had a bunch of soybeans, there's not going to be a high demand, meaning the price is going to be really, really low. So the U.S. government will buy it to give money back to the farmers so they can be sustainable, and then they donate or sell it to other foreign governments. Look at the dairy productivity here in the United States. So... Here's the yield, uh, 60, 1970, 1980, pretty cool, and then the yield went way up because they started to enhance it. They got more efficient with machines, um, but they did. They enhanced milk production with growth hormones. That's why you got to really consider what you're drinking, but the production went way up. So we have tons of milk, and then as far as the, the herds, the herds went way down so you can have Less cows producing more and more milk. So think about that. I don't know if that's a good thing because you're drinking milk that's uh, highly modified. But that's just me as a person, not as a teacher, okay? So don't get crazy on me. Challenges for farmers in developed countries. Well, they need to have access to markets. The distance to the market influences the crop that you plant. Meaning if you're a dairy farmer, you want to be pretty close to the market because you're Dairy is going to spoil on a long trip across the country. That wouldn't be good. So in the first ring here, we're looking at Von Thunen's model. He came up with rings. You can think of it as like the middle of the city here, and as you go out from the city farther and farther away, um, you have different products. It also could be across a country. Like this could be like, you know, the middle of the country and all the way across the country as well. Anyways, this model was created by Johann Heinrich Von Thunen from Germany in 1826 and you can use it in cities. We also apply it to the national or global scale. So in the first ring, we're looking at things that perish, like market-oriented gardens and milk producers. It's also pretty expensive to deliver. In the second ring, this is where you've got forestry, 
wood for timber and fuel. It's close because it's really bulky and it's heavy to transport. In the third ring, you have got various crops and pasture. Actually, here's a third ring right here where um, you're growing crops and it's a little less expensive for land, but you know, you're still pretty close to the city to get your product to market. And then in the fourth ring, you've got grazing, which requires a lot of space. Therefore, land would be the cheapest. Think about it. You need a lot of wide open spaces. Your cattle are roaming everywhere. It costs a lot of money. You're far away from the city. But when you're done with your cows, you can ship them by train a long distance, and they're going to last. So as you get farther and farther away from, this, from the city, you've got items that can last longer, and, and land is cheaper. Strategies to increase the world's food supply. Number one, increase exports from countries with surpluses. For example, in response to the increasing global demand for food, the USA passed Public Law 480, the Agricultural Trade and Assistance Act of, eight, excuse me, of 1954. They sold the grain at low interest rates, and they give grants to needy groups of people. This is the way the United States increases the world's food supply. And in fact, the United States is still the leader in grain exports, but Latin America and Southeast Asia have had rapid increases. Here are the exports of the entire world. So we're looking at things kind of staying consistent and then slowly go up since 1980, 1990. And then, of course, 2000 to 2010 went up exponentially as far as countries exporting food to be a part of the world food supply. Here is the exporters. Here are the exporters. United States, Brazil, Argentina, Australia. We're exporting bunches of food worldwide. And then the importers. Who needs a bunch of food? Russia and China. You still, of course, see North African countries because there's lots of desert area there as well and mainly lots of African countries. Another strategy to increase the world's food supply. Number two, expand the agricultural lands. Back in the day, you could keep the population growing and keep expanding, but now land is running out due to urbanization. Also, some places have land but not enough water due to desertification, where human actions have caused land to deteriorate and you can't actually grow crops there anymore. But excessive water also threatens places, which were possibly, they've ruined these farmlands because of over-irrigation. We take a look at the graph here. We've got population, which is going up and up and up over the last 50 years. But agricultural land has remained pretty much the same. That could potentially be a big problem. Here's our hazards of desertification. Where you've got arid land, you're not going to be growing very many crops. Very high degree of desert desertification, where it's being used up. Look at all these areas around uh, the Middle East. Right near the deserts, they're starting to lose a lot of their lands. Northwestern and western United States, we've seen too much land be ruined. Um, and areas where you think you got tons of reserve, still in Mexico, rainforest areas, rainforest areas in southern uh, Africa, lots of areas actually in uh, portions of uh, southeastern, excuse me, southwestern Russia, India. Still looking like it's got a lot of area where you can work on farmland. Little chance for desertification. Strategy number three to getting more food in the world. Expand fishing. We can do this by capturing wild fish from the ocean or by aquaculture or aqua farming. This is the cultivation of seafood under controlled conditions. And here you can see an aqua farm right here where they're growing fish in these tanks and holding them. So there's no real need to go out into the ocean. They just grow them themselves. Fish consumption has increased more rapidly than population growth. Fish production has increased, but a large portion goes to feeding animals. And overfishing is a big problem because the population of some fish species have declined because they were harvested faster than they can grow. Think of specifically tuna and swordfish, big popular items as far as seafood eating. Um, so <clears throat> here's aquaculture where people were growing their own fish. It didn't really expand until after 19... 90, and then you start to see it take off. Uh, the total fish production, again, continues to go up and up and up and up and up and up. Uh, whereas fishing kind of goes up as well, but it doesn't meet the demands of the total uh, amount of fish and demand being caught.
Here's fish production. United States, North America doing a lot. Brazil, a lot. Russia, China, India, South Asian, Southeast Asian countries, a lot as well. Strategy number four, increase productivity. We're looking at something called the Green Revolution. This was the invention and rapid diffusion of more productive agricultural techniques during the 70s and 80s, where they created higher yield seeds and they expanded their use of fertilizers. Because of the Green Revolution, agricultural productivity has increased faster than population. Remember uh, how we're worried that because population growth would be too explosive that we would run out of food? Well, they, in a way, fixed that where they created miracle seeds. These seeds were less sensitive to variation in the day length, and they responded better to fertilizers, and they matured faster. Consider that India had a food shortage in the 1960s, but in 1971, they had a surplus because of the techniques from the Green Revolution. In order to pull this off, though, farmers needed machines, irrigation pumps, and fertilizers. Here's the thing, though. The, the uh, Green Revolution, it, it uses genetically modified foods. A lot of people think that's a, a good thing because we're creating food and it saves lives. And other people think it's a bad thing because genetically modifying crops affects what you are eating. And potentially that could be very harmful. And there's a lot of controversy on that. But genetically modified foods or GM, genetically modified, or GMOs, genetically modified organisms, 10% of all crops are devoted to GM crops. I don't know if you realize that. GM is especially widespread. Genetically modified foods are especially widespread in the United States, with three-fourths of everything we eat having a product in it that is GM. That to me is concerning. Like I want to have food for enough people, definitely. But I also, not, I'm not sure that genetically modified foods is the way to go. Again, that's just me personally, not as a teacher. I'm just throwing that out there. Opposition is, it causes health problems. You could destroy long-standing ecological balances and reduce effectiveness of antibiotics. Export problems. European countries still require laboring, labeling to say GMOs. You know, for the most part, the United States does not require us to put made genetically modified tomatoes. We just, you know, say, uh, it's just food. And then, along with GM, there's the increased dependence on the U.S. corporations, such as Monsanto, who manufactures the most GM crops. And they even created a terminator gene that prevents seed from regrowth, meaning if you're a poor farmer in Mexico and you go and buy seeds, you would think that you could plant them, take care of your crops, and use the seeds from those crops to regrow for next year. No. A lot of corporations like Monsanto created terminator seeds where you have to Go back to Monsanto every single year and buy your seeds. You cannot use your own seeds. That's just a way of making money. Some people look at, it, look at it, but the other way is that's just not sustainable. And then developing countries are dependent on the Monsanto Corporation and the United States. So that's a big concern. These labels are required in Europe and not in the United States. Sustainable agriculture. So agricultural practices that preserve and enhance the environmental quality. Farmers typically produce low revenues, but they have lower costs. The United Nations found that in 2009, 0.6% of farmland is organic. So not a lot. They utilize sensitive land management where you have ridge tillage. It's where you plant crops on ridges for minimum soil disturbance. Now, it's not like a huge hill ridge. It's like, you know, this big. Every row has got a little ridge like this. Okay, it's still it kind of looks the same as what you might see in the United States, but um, it uses a lot less actual uh, soil and they use limited chemicals. They only use chemicals on the ridge instead of the entire field. And something else that helps is using integrated crop and livestock where they balance the number of animals and use them to fertilize the crops. This is all ways of using sustainable agriculture. And that is your look at Chapter 10. That was Kyushu 4.